Our uh, gospel lesson this morning is uh, uh, from Mark's gospel, the eighth chapter, verses 27 through 38. And I invite you to listen to the word. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Every living creature sheds. Plants and trees shed leaves, petals, seeds. Animals, including people, shed hair, fur, feathers, scales. It's part of this wonderful world that God has created. Sometimes it's a little messy, but it's part of the world God has created. And of all the shedding creatures in the world, my favorite happens to be my mom's least favorite, the snake. It's because snakes don't just drop a a flake or a a hair here or there on a random basis or shed constantly, like my cats. (laughs) Snakes shed their skin, and it's rather fun, at least for me, to find a snake skin when I'm out hiking. It's fun to see those. I didn't know if you knew this or not, but snakes become very active when they are shedding their skin. I used to go to the San Antonio Zoo on a regular basis. It's a great downtime on a Sunday afternoon. I could be around people, but I didn't have to engage with anyone. I also enjoy going to the zoo on my own, any zoo, Because if I do that, I get to spend as much time at an exhibit as I want to without some small person tugging on my arm demanding that we go see Simba. And because I've done that and been able to spend time at at, at different exhibits, I've had some really neat experiences. And the best one that I had in San San Antonio happened in the reptile house. There was a cobra, probably still is, a cobra in San Antonio. And every time I went, I would try to see him. But he was a shy snake. He liked to stay hidden in the back corner where you could just barely make out part of his body. Until one day, I happened to be there when he was shedding his skin. And this snake was moving like crazy through his enclosure. They do that so that the skin will snag on rocks and branches that helps to pull that old skin off. So I got to see the whole snake, and he was moving, and he was so cool looking. He never rose up and did the hood thing because he wasn't threatened, 
Did you know that they are really long snakes? <laughs> Cobras are really long. They're not big or round like a, a, a constrictor, but they are really, really long. And watching him in action put me in my happy place. My mom does not know what to do with me <laughs> because of this stuff. I realized that when I was remembering the cobra, that there is one way in which we are like snakes. It is when we shed our skins that we too are the most active, the most alive. Whatever that skin may be, when we are changing somehow, we're not static. We move. Now it may be movement because of discomfort, or it may be movement that's caused by relief or even joy. But whatever the cause, we're active, live, and not hiding in the back of enclosures where no one can see us. That may seem like a strange introduction to today's passage. And yet this passage is really about what it means to shed our skins instead of saving them. We join Jesus and the band as they travel around Caesarea Philippi, a city, a, a city in that area that was distinct because it was distinctly Roman. It wasn't just that they were, like, say, in Gentile territory, like the surrounding area where they had been. Caesarea Philippi was Roman. It was, even, even its name is Roman. It was named after Caesar Augustus, which is where we get the Caesar apart, and Philip, the son of Herod the Great. Philip is the one who built the city up. Herod the Great and his sons, Herod and Philip, all ruled at the pleasure of Rome. The Caesar of Philippi was a city that was built for the empire, and it showed. It was a city that reflected the power and the wealth of the empire in its trappings. This is the setting Jesus is in when he asks that infamous questions, those infamous questions of his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? We tend to think that Peter gives the right answer. He responds, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ. And Peter's answer is important, and it's important for two reasons. The first one is this is the first time in Mark's gospel that the title Christ is used for Jesus since chapter 1, verse 1. This is the first time. Because up until now, Jesus hasn't done anything that made him really unique. I know that might sound shocking. But there were other itinerant teachers and, and healers during that time, and there were many who would gain a following. There were also other rebels out there speaking against Rome and the leaders who kowtowed to the empire. So Jesus hasn't done anything to uniquely reveal himself to be the Christ. So that makes you wonder if this wasn't some kind of divine moment of inspiration for Peter to use that title. Then again, the second reason that Peter's response is important is that he's wrong. Now that might again sound a bit shocking to say, but Peter's use of the title here is the empire's definition. Surrounded by the trappings of Rome's military power, Peter's mind goes to the military definition of the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to be this great warrior like Joshua and Gideon of old. He would muster an army, drive out the Romans, and reestablish the throne of David, 
bringing Judah and Israel back to that time when they had power and might. This Messiah would show those Romans who was boss. He would, as we would say today, come to take names and kick butt. That's what Peter means when he says, you are the Christ. And it's why he gets so upset when Jesus gives the first of these passion predictions. Because like many other things, Jesus takes that title Messiah, that title Christ, and he turns it upside down. The title goes from being one of military might to one of humble service, the Son of Man. And then after their altercation that they have, Jesus goes further, informing them that they too must give up their lives in order to follow him. But just as Peter misunderstands what it meant to call Jesus the Christ, so we can misunderstand what Jesus means when he says those who lose their life for the sake of the gospel will save it. And this text has been used to justify suffering. It's been used to justify violence. It's been used to justify murder as martyrdom over the centuries. And now once again in our world, it is taking on a militaristic bent as people are being called to take up the cross as a weapon, to turn it into a sword or a gun or a bomb. It's being brandished about as a call to save a supposedly threatened way of life. And yet those who try to save their lives will lose them. In this passage, Jesus calls on his followers not to become an army to save their lives, but to become servants who place him and others ahead of themselves. They are called not to save their skins. They're called to shed their skins. We are called to shed our skins the false skins that we wear, the skins that say we have to look out for ourselves only, the skins that say we don't have enough so we need to protect our stuff at all costs, the skins that reflect back to us those false images of others, not only as strangers but as enemies, those skins those ideas and actions designed to save us are what kills us because they keep us from experiencing the full life of shalom in Christ. We are supposed to shed those skins and we're supposed to shed them on a regular basis. And when we do, we find ourselves renewed with new energy and a new lightness of being. When we shed something, whether it's old stuff we don't need anymore or old attitudes that weigh us down, we feel energized. Just like a snake when it sheds its skin. Our divine imaginations begin to stir again as the old skin is left behind. We become more active, more alive. Shedding our skins does come with a cost. It may mean leaving others behind who are clinging so hard to their old skins that they stay huddled in a back corner. It may mean living, leaving behind things that we have given value to, material items, wealth, power, status. It may be painful at times because the old skins tell us we can't let anything go. But we're not called to save our skins. 
We are called to shed them so that we can leave ourselves open to the exposure of God's love through Christ. We're called to shed them so that we can show that same love in the way that we live and love and follow. Shedding our skins is how we save our lives. Not our individual lives, but the life of faith, the life of community, the life of discipleship that follows the one we call Christ. Amen.